Welcome back to the couple. E couple, the couple. I don't know. Pronounce that weird. Uh, but get to mix it up. Uh, I am back, um, and I'm doing like more of like an Emmett Penny introduction now. I'm putting a little more spice into my intros. But I'm back here with Maddie Hilly. Um, Maddie is a two or three time guest here on Decouple. Uh, go check out the archives uh, for other great stuff from her. Um, Maddie's kind of famous. She's kind of a big deal. I think she has the title for the uh, authorship of Nuclear Advocacy's most viral tweet ever um, on nuclear waste. Um, and we're going to be talking about that today. But the bio doesn't stop there. Um, also recently published in the New York Times. Um, great article. Nuclear waste is misunderstood. Um, Maddie is uh, got a. F- Sorry, I'm, I've been. I'm not swearing anymore. Flipping awesome uh, a Substack, splitting the atom. Go sign up for that. Um, she is the I forget what position, but I think like the I mean founder, top dog if it's president, director, whatever of campaign for a green nuclear deal, and um, you know an absolute pit bull in the fight for Byron and Dresden. Um, yeah, I don't know, Maddie. Uh, I stole the self introduction from you, but I'll just ask you what's new. Wow, I am. My ears are I'm flushed. Thank you. That was a very nice introduction. I hope I live up to the hype. What's new? Um, I've been talking about nuclear waste a lot. Um, and yeah, I had that op ed in the New York Times. Um, in Illinois, now we've moved the conversation from should we be saving existing nuclear power plants to can we repeal the moratorium on new nuclear so we can build more? And a lot of that focuses, a lot of those concerns and those politics focus around waste as well. So I've been pretty obsessed with nuclear waste for the last year. And I think that shows in my comms and the work I've been doing. Oh, man, I was just interviewing Jeremy Whitock on proliferation, and it was like the three concerns with nuclear. Oh, yeah. <laughs> waste weapons and whoops like the whoop being accidents how cool right. is that the triple the <laughs> That's triple pretty w good. i'm gonna have to use that yeah yeah anyway and you know just so so important to, like we're going to be talking you know one of the w's um but in general i'm just uh, trying to stay um focused on always mixing that up with you know the positive vision that that we have for a nuclear powered future uh, but that's not the purpose of today's interview. As uh, listeners have probably guessed, we are we're deep diving the waste thing. Ever since that tweet came out, I've been um, knocking on Maddie's door, and finally, this has uh, all come together. Um, it's public knowledge now. Um, your New York Times mentioned it, but you're also expecting, um, so that's that's very cool. I always like list that as my greatest accomplishment. Um, not that I was expecting or gave birth or anything, but just, uh, you know, they're wonderful. Yeah. I'm so excited. And it, it was an interesting part of writing that story because, you know, my editor was, you know, she had this sort of cursory understanding of nuclear. She certainly wasn't anti-nuclear, but, you know, was sort of, um, you know, pushing back with a lot of the baked in anti-nuclear bias and takes. And one of the things she kept pressing me on was like, what about the next generation? Aren't we burdening the next generation? And finally, I got a little frustrated and sent in an email like, I'm 27 years old. If I don't count as the next generation, the baby I'm pregnant with certainly does. And she's like, we have to talk about that. So normally I like the argument, you know, I try to keep it like the personal part of it out because I want my ideas to stand on their own merit. But I think it did introduce this cool, like, you know, I'm very comfortable with continuing to manage waste into the future. And I hope that my daughter's generation has a sorry, swearing on the podcast, a crap ton (laughs) more nuclear waste to have to manage than we do because I want it to be a nuclear powered, abundant, prosperous future. Amen, sister. Amen. So, you know, obviously the listenership of decouples, um, quite educated on this. So we'll, we'll try and keep, uh, some of this, uh, pretty, pretty hasty. 
Um, I think I've heard one of your key things when like, th- this is also going to be kind of a, a bit of a masterclass on, on waste communication. And maybe, I don't know, maybe we'll label the, the uh, episode that way. We'll have to get you to play some piano at the beginning, Maddie. I'm not sure if you tickle the ivories or not, but you could do the like, whatever. <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm actually serious. We'll try and get that on. Um, so when asked, um, you know, what is nuclear waste? If, if people get there, how do you respond to that? So I start by talking about the spent nuclear fuel, and and I think a lot of people who are more technical, probably a lot of your listeners will think, well, that's not all the nuclear waste. We have tritiated water. We have the low-level waste and medium-level waste. But most, when the, as far as the public is concerned, they're thinking about the green liquid goo stored in oil barrels from The Simpsons. And so they're really focused about the spiciest, focused on the spiciest high level waste. So I just say nuclear waste is just spent nuclear fuel. And I like to have my phone, you know, everyone has their phone on them. So in my favorites on my phone, I have a picture of me next to a fuel assembly and say, this is what it looks like going in. And that's actually what it looks like going out as well. And so it's not liquid and green. It's shiny metal tubes bundled together, goes in, cooks in the reactor, comes out, is allowed to cool off, and then put in these large steel and concrete containers. We call them dry casks. And they just sit currently on site and are monitored. It's really boring. I show them the picture of Paris Ortiz Wines hugging the waste. I show myself, you know, selfie, uh, at the Zion nuclear waste site, just 30 minutes north of me in Illinois. And I think it's really important. The reason I'm talking about these visuals is that everyone already has imaginary images of waste in their head, whether it's like Mr. Burns and Smithers shoving these barrels into a glowing tree or like Greenpeace (laughs) and Friends of the Earth putting like those same like radioactive symbol barrels scattered across the landscape. And I think people gen- like genuinely think that's what we do. So bringing it into the real world, showing them what the waste looks like, showing them that you can touch it, that you can be near it, talking about what it really is kind of replaces that imaginary image with something that's, you know, physically exists in reality. And you feel people become more at ease once they understand that. Yeah, um, you know, our decouple studios, uh, you know, videographer, wonder boy, comedian, uh, Jesse Freeston, he, you know, he was talking about some of the euphemisms that the industry uses. And I think we use them as well sometimes. Spent fuel. We're actually in Ontario talking about just byproducts. Um, and he made a video, like, you should listen to his, the most recent episode of Nuclear Barbarians. Emmett interviews Jesse. It's hilarious, awesome. And I think, well, it's just wonderful. Um, but one of the things he talks about is, you know, making this, uh, we, we did, a he's done a waste video now, but he did a video up with you, Maddie, actually, um, at the world's largest operating nuclear facility, um, in Bruce County <coughs> in Ontario, <coughs> in Canada. And, um, uh, sorry, like the weird nationalism sneaks its way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, um, you know, he showed it to his friends cause Jesse comes from, you know, the Naomi Klein world, like the David Suzuki world. If you don't catch those references, just like you know, super lefty, um, environmental folks. And he's, he's thinking about like, not that as his only audience, but basically he was saying like, he showed them the video and they were like, but you know, where he talks about, um, spent fuel and he's like standing on a gantry over the primary spent fuel bay where that waste is cooling off, as he said, in the big deep swimming pool. And, uh, that's in the video and his friends were like, yeah, but what about the waste? (laughs) He's like, that was the waste. And he's like, so it's important to use that word. How do you feel about that? Like, you know, you use the term spent fuel, you've used the term waste, like in terms of the communications masterclass here, what, what's your take? I almost never shy away from using waste because that's what people are concerned about. And so if they're not clear, now I, I'm comfortable saying nuclear waste is primarily spent nuclear fuel to make it clear that what's going in is what's coming out. There's not this extra gooey substrate that somehow magically appears But in general, I think it's really important to address, you know, I think there was this push to sort of rename nuclear or rebrand. We've like, in this sort of influencer age, we're like, okay, that's not popular. How do we rebrand or, and I just don't think that's 
you know, this is not a new car. This is a technology that's been established that people, that exists, that looms large in people's consciousness. So really just, it's more about reframing or like correcting what they already believe than like trying to trick them with some sort of new name. And honestly, like byproducts, I don't know, like sounds like kind of creepy or weird. I, I feel like yeah, I yeah, get yeah, the you impulse. Gotta, trying to hide something. <laughs> Right. And it and it's like it comes from a genuine place often. Like yeah. engineers are really hyper focused on being technically accurate. And like from an engineering perspective, that's great. You should be technic. I'm glad that these engineers have that skill. But it's very different when it comes to communication, where it's like, so the transuranics and the fission products that it's like, OK, like, let's take a step back for the people who don't really want to know that. They want to know, is it safe today? Is it safe tomorrow? Lots of people strangely want to know if it's safe into the apocalypse, which is it's a when whole When the sun becomes thing. a red dwarf planet and consumes the <laughs> earth in a great fireball. What's going on with the waste then, Maddie? <laughs> yeah, um, there's a lot we to unpack that. We talked about that. We, we got into the sort of cosmic time scale with Mark in the Uranium Masterclass. So, um, you know, and in terms of the low level, uh, you know, I was touring the Western Waste Management Facility here in Ontario. Um, they have the high level, the low level, the medium level. And I don't think we need to spend a lot of time on that. But to suffice, it, suffice it to say, like the low level is just like gloves that were worn. Like if you walk into level, th like the I forget the exact term, there's one, two and three in terms of the way that the plant's broken up. There's the kind of electro generation stuff, the turbines and then medium zone and and a, you know, hot zone, which is often still like you still don't get any dose whatsoever. But like if you go into that three zone, all the clothes you're wearing, not your undies, but your gloves, whatever, come off and go in a waste bin. And they were, um, you know, trying to reduce that low level waste inventory because that stuff does pile up. Um, you know, most of it is totally landfillable. Uh, but 60 percent of it wasn't actually it didn't actually have any radioactive contamination on it whatsoever. And so they were like yeah, we're going to get rid of that stuff now. <laughs> like, why not? Anyway, so just, just to cover that without going into detail, you talked a bit about what we currently do with it. Um, you know, the pool, dry cast storage, um, you know, military waste actually is kind of green glowing goop that um, is handled, handled differently. We have an episode on that way, way back um, with James Conca. Talks a lot about the WIP, the Waste Isolation Pilot Project. Um, so I don't think we need to, to go into that too much. Um, I think the dry casks are are a big thing. You've you visited. I'm not sure if you've had the the privilege and honor of hugging one. Um, you know, my understanding is they're licensed for a certain period, and then they're probably good for you know another long period. Like I, th I think that's well, like, they're just sitting there on the concrete pad. Like you know, they're licensed for 40 years or something. That means that they're done and they're cracking and like you know, green goop is is oozing out of them. What's what's been your experience of the of the dry cask uh, issue and and how to communicate about it and whether you've you know again interacted in any way with, with the dry casks? Yeah, so this is again where I find this um, sort of difference between the industry or like more engineers and then the people who are actually managing the waste day to day. So in the U.S., at least the casks we use are licensed for forty years at a time, and you know you can presumably like reactors, upon good monitoring and reapplication, extend that license. But our casts are designed to last 100 years and last 100 years while being able to be hit by a missile or hit by a speeding train or, you know, survive any act of God or man, um, essentially. And so these things are built to last. They are durable. And when I went to Zion, so this is a site in uh, northern Illinois that used to host a nuclear power plant that was shut down prematurely in the 90s, and now that waste still sits on site. And so it was this, you know, uh, I visited it last year, and the company, I believe it was Energy Solutions, that took over the site and remediated it was, like, trying to show off how incredible it was that they had returned this land that you wouldn't even know a nuclear plant yeah. sat there. And so for me, that was like a, oh, like I hate seeing that. But it's, it was. It tore down an industrial like, cathedral. I know. <laughs> I like think I hung my head and got it. Mark Nelson got a picture of me being sad. 
Um, but it was, you know, at least it's something to push back on when people say this land can't be reused. It's like, no, it can actually be completely remediated to where you just erased all the all the infrastructure as well as the jobs, the tax revenue, the generational wealth. Anyways, that aside, I was talking to them about the cask storage and they said, yeah, these are probably going to last for far longer than 100 years. They're really durable. Almost like I was dumb for asking if they will be okay in 40 years. And then, you know, getting sort of into the long-term solutions, I might be jumping ahead, but there's this insistence in the industry that what we are doing is okay for now, but becomes dangerous into the future. And it's only interim and we need something and we need something and it's not safe. And so I asked, how big of a deal would it be if, you know, say a hundred years from now, 200 years from now, we start to notice some signs of degradation or just like we're concerned could you just transfer this into another cask? And they said, absolutely, it would be trivial. And I mean, if you think about it, that's what we already do, right? We transfer these fuel assemblies into the cask, except in 100 to 200 years, it is far less dangerous by the nature of radiation. It's less toxic, poses less risk. So why wouldn't we just be able to transfer and extend that system a century, maybe two centuries at a time? Um, so that's sort of crazy to say, or it, I deviate from the industry a lot when I talk about that, but there's no, no one has given me a reason that that is not physically possible and sound and safe. Right, right, right. And I think we'll get into like, you know, what to do with the waste long-term and we'll talk a lot more about DGRs, but I mean, I don't know, we won't skip ahead too much, but like the, a lot of the rationale I hear is, well, we need to answer this question of, you know. What, what to do with this like kind of forever waste, that kind of conception. We'll, we'll myth bust that in a second, I'm sure. Um, but, you know, that this will somehow diffuse the anti-nukes once we have the solution. And I mean, I just debated Gordon Edwards, who's in Canada's kind of premier anti-nuclear figure, the grandfather of that movement, if you will. Um, and he's like, you know, like, this is not an excuse to make even more of this stuff, right? Like at any point, it, you know, so like that absolutely doesn't work. And then for me, like, you know, it, it, it sort of amounts to like the urgency and like, you know, we have a $26 billion fund um, to develop this deep geologic repository. And it's like, we should be building new can with that. Like that could build a lot of power plants, you know, even yeah. if we went over budget, like that's the urgency here, folks. Like there's a different waste problem, you know, and it's, totally. it's air pollutants and CO2 and whatever else. Right. So anyway. And I have sympathy for the desire to like, oh, the public is really concerned about this. Like we can we can engineer a solution to address those problems, like really taking that at face value, taking it literally. But I think I can't remember if I mentioned this on a previous episode, but my start into nuclear advocacy of environmental progress was a research project where I looked at all um, planned and canceled starting construction and canceled and then eventually built nuclear plants in the U.S. So if it was an idea that existed for a nuclear plant, I've looked at it and I've, you know, went through all the court documents. I went through the newspaper archives, the history, and you just see the exact same anti-nuclear game being played where it's like, we're fine with nuclear as long as you do this and then moving heaven and earth to get that accepted and then block it. So for example, Allison McFarlane, who is a former NRC commissioner, insanely enough, she wrote an op-ed recently for Scientific American talking about nuclear waste is piling up. Do we have a plan? And the need for a deep geological repository. She spent her much of her career blocking Yucca Mountain. So I just think when you see the history and see this play out, you just realize it's really not about the solution for the people who are like the most adamant that they would accept nuclear if only. It's really just a strategy to prevent nuclear from being built or for buying into that framework. It's it's interesting when you kind of discuss being, a, um, I don't know, it's almost like you're a graduate from like one of the most intense um, nuclear 
um, education programs in the world, like all of the environmental progress, uh, I'll, call, I'll call you guys graduates or whatever, right? <laughs> um, you guys really, um, I think we're held up to a pretty high culture of excellence and did a lot of original research. And one of the things I remember hearing, I'm not sure if this was your research project or someone else's at EP, was actually looking at, well, what's the safety record of this super dangerous waste? Um, have there been any documented deaths from you know, stored civilian nuclear waste, and that's not reprocessing. I know there have been a few sort of accidental criticalities with reprocessing, but maybe you can answer that question or tell us about what that research project was like. Um, deaths from stored civilian nuclear waste, 70 years all over the world. What did you find? Yeah, so this was, I was part of this project where we just wanted to archive all nuclear energy related deaths. Like if there was some random worker who had a heart attack at a nuclear plant, you know, we wanted to try to know about it. Like part of that is so we can be ready to answer, you know, what about this? What about this? But one is like, we really want to check what our claims that this is the safest technology that we've ever created to boil water. And it's true. Like they, I mean, on-site cask storage has a perfect safety record. You know, no one has been harmed from this waste. And it's just, I, I, it's hard. I mean, I'm struggling to even talk about it because it's almost so inconceivable that something that is perceived as so uniquely dangerous is so incredibly safe and other chemicals and industrial waste that we just accept deaths from or accept as dangerous that people don't even think about um, are much more, you know, dangerous, but don't even, you know, trigger the public's thoughts. It's it the gulf between reality and public perception is so enormous on this issue, which is why I think I find it so interesting and so important to talk about, because I think it's not just one of you know, we talked about at the beginning, you like to talk about what a beautiful nuclear future would look like. And this is more of a debunking. But I even see it as more of a reversal than that. It's not like the least bad solution we have. This is an excellent solution. I want a future where we have casks that artists, local artists paint and children can like visit. Like I do think it's actually part of a beautiful future where we are responsible environmental stewards, and this is seen as an asset and not as a problem. I mean, I, I have to say, um, after the success of your tweet, I, I tried to piggyback on that and did a little bit of an imitation tweet. I was like, maybe I can see if I can get 25,000 new followers and whatever else. <laughs> um, yeah, it was good. It was good. I think I got 2,000 new followers. But anyway, blah, blah, blah. I mean, that my big focus was, you know, we make dangerous things safe. Um, and making that comparison to aviation, which just has so many more complexities, um, which I won't get into again, check out the thread if you're interested. Um, but just, you know, it's so obvious flying at, at 30,000 feet is some dangerous ash. Okay. Bleep that out. Um, and you know, <laughs> landing planes, everything, air traffic control, you know, maintenance, it's crazy how safe it is. Uh, you know, I guess I will go into a few facts, but like 4.3 billion passenger passenger flights in 2019, I believe pre pandemic. Um, you know, like that's 43 million separate, separate flights. Um, and like one, 200 deaths per year on average. It's, it's absolutely incredible. And then, you know, when you think about the simplicity of shielding this stuff, which absolutely, I think that's part of my comm strategy is, is just acknowledging this stuff is crazy dangerous as it comes out of the reactor. Right. Um, you know, stand on next to unshielded nuclear waste at a meter for like five, 10 seconds and death sentence. Right. But somehow, right. You know, and then, you know, Jesse also, you know, took that angle in his his waste video, which everyone should check out if they haven't, um, you know, just comparing it to ladders or like stuff that we are complacent about. Um, right. Anyway, as an emerge doc, I'm pretty passionate about ladders. Um, but anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I think I think that's another another sort of key key point, um, you know, it, it conceding this shit is dangerous, but but danger hazard risk. Right. Right. And to your point, it's like this is incredibly dangerous coming out of a reactor. Like this is nothing to joke around about. But ironically, that's not what people are scared of. They're like, what about the waste in 30,000 years? And it's like, you shouldn't right. be scared of that at all, actually. Like you'd have to snort it or eat it 
um, it's totally fine. You should be worried about the people taking it out. And the reason you're not is because they're, we've made this so inherently safe. We don't have accidents. And I think, I'm not sure if your research on dry cast storage included like people getting squished by, you know, these several hundred ton dry cast containers. But like from what I've seen, like they're moved so slowly. Like it's just, it's, it's, and there's so many procedures with anything nuclear. Like it's, I would, I would not, I'm ADHD. I cut corners all the time. Like I, I would get fired on day one of working at a nuclear plant, but like it takes a certain personality, right? We're much better on the comm side, shall we say, than, <laughs> than operations. But um, for sure, like it's, yeah. I, so I don't know if your research included, you know, because you know, as you're saying, if you have a heart attack at a nuclear plant, it's, it's you know, taken seriously. Or like the injury-free hours, like millions of injury-free hours on our ref refurbishments uh, here in Ontario. And, you know, one guy had a trip fall accident, you know, just walking on a grate or something and broke his knee. And that was like, okay, reset the clock. I haven't had an accident right. in five hours now, but before that it was like 1.3 million hours. Like it's, it's safer to work at a nuclear plant than to work in the office of the regulator of that nuclear plant, like in an office building oh, in Ottawa. Totally. Like it's crazy. Yeah. And it was something I have to admit, like as a young person who is passionate about nuclear and kind of annoyed with all the anti-nuclear talking points, I might've been I mean, I'm, I was a bit flippant about the safety where it's like, it's overly safe. It's overly regulated. I, I scissor kicked over a, over a barrier, um, in a parking lot at a <laughs> nuclear plant. Um, because I didn't want to walk around like the handrail, <laughs> and, like the security, like practically pointed guns at me. <laughs> I, you know, that doesn't surprise me, but actually what really like cemented that like changed my mind or like made me appreciate that culture a little bit more was actually visiting Bruce with you guys and talking to Dan Campbell, who is the nuclear operator who had transferred from a coal plant to work at the nuclear plant. He's like, I love working here because I know every day I'm coming home safe and I'm not breathing in, you know, all of that air from the coal plant. I, am guaranteed to be walking home to my kids later. And so I think there is, there's just something like really great about nuclear being the gold standard for safety. I think sometimes it can manifest itself in frustrating or expensive ways. And that's definitely part of the conversation. But in general, it's something that the industry should celebrate. Like this is Inc an incredibly safe technology. And to your point, we've made it that way. It's not inherently safe, but we've made it safe. And that's something the left, um, if they actually gave a crap about workers, uh, would be, uh, you know, very excited about. Like, anyway, they should they should try um, actually, you know, talking to workers. I think that would be helpful. So, you know, <laughs> and okay, I think another thing, like you mentioned, these dry casts are licensed for 40 years. And, you know, like the way that the industry communicates about this, like, you know, I've, I was actually just Googling before we chatted, like, you know, trying to understand how long concrete can last for obviously like Roman concrete, there's Roman dams um, that are over 2000 years. I understand they had some different chemistry in their concrete. Um, you know, having steel rebar in concrete, you know, can age it. Um, radiation um, can age concrete maybe faster, but, you know, just getting a ballpark guess would be really helpful, you know, um, and but they'll never give they you the won't. ballpark. They'll never they give you the ballpark, yeah. but you know, just air. So I was looking this up, air erodes concrete and rock at a rate of around 0 0.05 millimeters per year or five millimeters per century, one decimeter in 2000 years. Um, you know, so again, there's other factors at play with the radiation, et cetera, but that was the closest I got to sort of that question of how long does concrete last for? <laughs> um, right. If anyone's listening and knows and can give me a straight <laughs> effing answer, um, please do, please do. It's okay, incredibly so we'll frustrating. Yeah, it's hard to get a straight answer out of it because it's, and I get it, it's like the lawyers and the liability, but it's just like, okay, just like person to person. Can you just give me something? Right, you and know? the answer is often so much different than than what you'll get from the comms people. But we'll, we'll talk about comms and critiques of comms uh, as we move along. Um, you know, so we, uh, volumes of waste, um, is that is that something that you you prioritize how many pellets you need to get all your electricity needs or the volume you know because you hear i mean uranium as we learned from mark nelson uh heaviest naturally occurring element on the periodic table so it's you know when you hear tons i mean and, and the numeracy that i share as well in terms of you know so 
how how do you get around or how do you not get around? How do you celebrate the <laughs> the volume question? Yeah, I mean, ex- example that was in the Scientific American op-ed. It was like there's eighty eight thousand tons, and we're creating more every year. And I just, you know, I mean, I knew it, but I thought as someone who didn't know, eighty eight thousand tons sounds like a lot. But when you put it into okay. Even if we put this in dry casks and stack this on a football field, 70 years of commercial operation would be less than 500 feet tall. And if you're just talking about the spiciest stuff that you're worried about, the fuel pellets, that's 10 feet tall. 70 years, 20% of our electricity. I mean, that's something to celebrate. Like you said, that's not something to be afraid of. I think this is a classic something like a classic waste fear mongering maneuvers. You give numbers absent any context, or you'll also, you know, you can give radiation in Becquerels or milliseverts and not explain what that is, or just say tons of radiation. I see that all the time, the tons of radiation flowing into the Pacific from Fukushima when like three, three grams of drink a gallon (laughs) Yeah, you would have to drink a gallon of the diluted water coming out into the ocean to have the same amount of radiation exposure as eating a banana. Like, that's embarrassing, almost. <laughs> I'm like, I'm embarrassed to say it's that low. Right, right. I mean, and, and to give, you know, to give a more context, you know, it's, it realistically wouldn't be piled on a football field. If people are talking about digging a hole and putting it in there, I mean, that gives you a sense of the size of the hole you'd need. Um, I I. I quite like this uh, Holtex high store system, which is, you know, very shallow, burying, very accessible, very retrievable. And they can do 580 tons of used fuel per acre. Jack Devaney crunched some of the numbers. If we basically use nuclear for all of our electricity needs, um, it would and stored for 600 years before essentially kind of landfilling the stuff or reusing it. 21 square miles, about the size of Manhattan to do dry, like that high store dry cask storage for 600 years for you know, the whole U.S. producing all their electricity with nuclear, it gives you a sense of, of how manageable it is. And, you know, like I think Jesse has some some visuals um, in his waste video of like how much CO2 is produced every day, um, you know, in the U.S. and that kind of volume. And like it's like little little balls, essentially, like, you know, like over top of the Empire State Building spewing out everywhere. Like there's there's other waste streams, but we we very, very, very rarely put that in context or coal ash or, you know, whatever else you want to you want to get at. So. Or or wind uh, or solar panels, which I think three hundred to one in terms of volumes, you know, a little easier to to manage. Well, I mean, easier to manage in some ways, right? Because it's like I kind of wonder about the number of accidents just moving that volume around. Like it's clearly not going to fry you in five seconds, but it's like it's pretty easy to move tiny volumes of nuclear waste underwater into a pool and then into a dry cask compared to, you know, three hundred times that. Um, I don't know into shipping containers, into landfills, into the global electronic. you know, waste distribution stream. Right. I mean, that's the big difference between the industries. Like volumes aside, the nuclear industry is responsible for managing their waste from mining all the way to spent nuclear fuel and beyond. Like we have this sense that we need to monitor this for thousands of years. And a lot of other technologies, including solar and wind, are not held to that standard. So they're just entering normal electronic waste stream or just ending up in the environment being shipped over to Asia. The New York Times did an article about this. So from an environmental perspective, I'm grateful that no nuclear waste is ending up in the natural environment. And I think that should be the standard. Yeah, I mean, it's impossible for that to be the standard for basically every other energy uh, technology. So uh, you're right. setting a that high bar there. That should be the standard without saying like, okay, and it has to turn off if, you know, I having energy is the most important thing. I will always say all else equal, it would be better. Yeah, I mean, I, I was looking up some comparators. Um, in Canada, we have this old gold mine, uh, which ended up as a byproduct. I want to talk about byproducts, not waste. <laughs> Uh, produced enough arsenic to kill every human on earth four times over. Um, so a quarter million tons, I think you're saying all the spent nuclear fuel is 700, or in the U.S. anyway, is 780,000 or 88,000 88, tons. How many, sorry? 88,000. Oh, 88,000. Okay, 88, okay. So tons. we're talking now a quarter million tons of this toxic dust 
it's already leaked into the, the Great Slave Lake. Um, and the way they're stabilizing it, it's down in the mining tunnels, um, not in containers. Um, you know, the ground gets warmer as you go down. We went two kilometers down into uh, into the Canadian Shield, but that's a whole other story. Check out the Decouple episode, uh, Decouple Studios episode. Uh, but they're just pumping like a coolant um, to sort of try and freeze the rock around it so water doesn't get in and out. I mean, this these are some of the other waste problems that we have. And it's just like that cooling system. OK, you want to talk about lasting something lasting a thousand years? come on right and with global warming like right now it relies it's in a cold area so in the winter it's fine but in the summer it's a bit challenging but like there we have we have bigger fish fish to fry without getting too uh too technical okay so so i think one of the key things you know you mentioned is people worry about it on on like a super long time scale so tell us about exponential radioactive decay right I mean, that's sort of the beautiful thing about nuclear waste. It's unique in that it becomes less dangerous over time. And so how radiation works is that the spicier, the more radioactive something is, the shorter the half-life, it becomes far less dangerous much more quickly. So yes, when that spent nuclear fuel is right out of the reactor, it's really hot. But by 40 years, it will have lost 99, over 99 percent of its radioactivity and its thermal energy. So you're already talking about 99 percent reduction. And um, and the longer lived isotopes are, again, they have longer half-lives, which means they're less dangerous, like because of how that's just the nature of radiation. And so, you know, we talked about this before. You would have to actually grind up spent fuel and inhale it or ingest it to have any sort of like health risk posed to you after. And that's 500 years. And the thing that I find helpful to talk about is we deal with toxic waste every day that never becomes less toxic over time. I think that the concept of half life and having radioactivity remain for hundreds of thousands of years really scares people. But there are most of the substances that we manage, the highly toxic substances, never lose that toxicity. So I talk about anhydrous ammonia, which is extremely explosive. Flammable is, uh, you know, an clear gas. It can be on site before responders even like can detect it and it never becomes less toxic over time. And in fact, we have fatalities and injuries, you know, not fatalities every year, but certainly leaks and injuries every year in the U S now there's no public outcry to ban it. And that's a good thing because it's a really important input for fertilizer. That's what feeds us. So we accept some level of risk and waste because it's really important for society and for humanity and for prosperity. Um, But that's one thing that we get to be lucky. You know, again, it's just contrary to popular belief. The radiation is actually a selling point for nuclear safety, not some reason to treat it as uniquely dangerous. I'm going to push back on that, Maddie. Because, um, and actually, I was this is this is kind of a testament to like how nerdy the nuclear advocacy world is. Um, but nuclear waste is forever waste because it decays to lead. Lead is a heavy metal. Um, so <laughs> I thought that was really interesting. But I mean, lead is also pretty useful. We use it for all, we use it for all kind of applications. Um, anyway, right. I, I just thought that's like a you know like this proviso that. <laughs> but like, actually, checkmate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. totally. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, in my tweet. In my my great tweet, um, you know, I I talked a bit about those those doses, right, and like and trying to make them intelligible, um, you know, to people making some medical comparisons. Um, so two hundred years after it comes into the reactor, um, standing just thirty centimeters away. Remember, we have the inverse square law, so it's dropping off by I think a, a factor of like a cube cube, like to the power of three. Um, it's the equivalent of four whole body CT scans. And like why you would need to stand there for, you know, an hour, I'm not exactly sure. But that that's because the gammas are highly penetrating and, and you get down, you know, in, I mean, not even 400 years, we're talking 200 years, there's not much gamma left. 
And that's why you need to eat it, swallow it. It's it's alphas, it's little heliums that are shooting off and blocked by a piece of paper or, or beta is blocked by aluminum foil. And so, you know, Jesse also in his Great Waste video, you know, he could cuddle a fuel bundle and watch like one of his really long favorite films or, or like every episode of Decouple Studios. Uh, <laughs> You know, cuddling the fuel bundle, I think it was at like, I'm not sure it was 400 or 600 years. You, you get the sense. And I think, you know, if he watched it with this fuel bundle 10, 10 feet away, you know, he could do it pretty quick, like 100 years. Anyway, look, look that up. It's a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, I think that really points to, um, you know, how manageable of a of a problem this is. Yeah. So let's maybe we will pivot to we've talked a little bit about dry cast. We've talked about high store. We're going to give deep DJ its own little chapter here. Um but, you know, Jesse highlighted Corva in the Netherlands, um, which is their, you know, they have an art gallery on top of their nuclear waste. You mentioned like painting the, the dry casks or having like a playground or something <laughs> like, are you aware of like anywhere else that, uh, you know, when we, when we highlighted Corva, I think the Swedes or something or the Swiss piped in and said, we also invite the public in. So like in your experience, like, I don't know what Zion, like when, when we went to Indian Point uh, recently with the team um they wouldn't let us touch the dry cast we could walk into the yard it was held but like we got like severely yelled at for like you know getting a few centimeters from the dry those. cast dose rates and yeah. you know when i visited in canada are less than flying in an airplane hugging it um but yeah like what, what's your sense of how the industry is doing in terms of those kind of comms in terms of bringing people in contact with with the waste i mean it's really it's at least my experience been like historically really bad like the opportunity to go see zion they brought community leaders um like the chief of police librarians council people and that was the first time they're like this is it and just like one of the women i think it was the librarian leaned over to me she's like this is really boring and i'm like <laughs> that's actually a great risk like i love that because there's no fear there that just is like, yeah, this is just a pad of concrete with a bunch of things. It's totally fine. So I think there's this impulse to shield the public, like to either not talk about it or to like to just kind of like, yeah, out of sight, out of mind, the issue. But I think that allows for the imaginary vision of the waste to dominate um, whenever it gets brought up. So I think the industry should be bringing people in. I think the facility in the Netherlands is a masterclass in what to do with waste because sometimes they have art installations hanging. I mean, the facility is like this bright kind of marigold orange color. It's very cool to see. I think they have field trips and like their equivalent of Girl Scout troops coming through. And so that's something that I would like to see it. Uh, at EP, we created this, and we we never ended up putting it anywhere, but I hope I can find it. It was this picture of dry casks, and we were like, what would, what would we do if we can make it beautiful and everyone got to, like, pick a design for their dry casks? So I think someone had, like, Van Gogh's Starry Night put onto it. Um, I came up with two that both made the final cut, you know, props to me. One was like a Lisa Frank design. Do you remember her from the 90s, those crazy colors? And it was like trippy psychedelic unicorns for like little girls. Okay, it was yeah, absolutely yeah. insane. And then one was like a Miller High Life can where you just <laughs> <laughs> like a, Or like an Andy um, Warhol there. soup can. Right. Tomato soup, yeah, exactly. Right? Like and so I'm like, this is like, because when people just see that, it's like, oh, you can, there's just concrete that you can paint. And so I yeah. got some pushback where it's like, wouldn't that make it harder to to monitor or isn't that dangerous? And actually the Shin Quarry, I have it right here, power plant has like birds painted on the top. And are we saying that like the oh, wow. South Koreans don't have good safety because they decided to like make their cooling tower. Well, did they drill prettier. holes in their containment or what's, what's up with that oh, object? Uh, <laughs> this is a, this is a candle, a tea light holder. Oh so, my god. No. Okay. The actual containment does not have holes. <laughs> okay, everybody jump onto YouTube, clear. subscribe to the YouTube channel and um <laughs> and and see the video there. Also, I've been meaning to make like mid-station breaks because we are really needing some help. Um so hop over to Patreon to give us some support. Don't forget to leave a nice like review, uh subscribe on YouTube and and on whatever podcast platform you're listening to and uh you know, give us props. 
um, spread the word. Okay, yeah, so art. I mean, Jesse talked about this as well in the Corva, uh, his little part on Corva, uh, the Netherlands waste management. Like they, they, you mentioned that beautiful kind of clementine color. They repaint every like 20 years, or that's their plan to show it diminishing. Like it gets fainter and fainter. The other thing is they talked about, like, people are like, well, it's so hard to store for 400 years. And they're like, we store art here that is 400, 500 years old and needs to be maintained. And like, not just here, but in art galleries, like human beings are capable of stewarding, you know, delicate, fragile canvases painted with God knows what kind of like pigments and animal fats that were used to make paint like in the Renaissance. And then my last comment is on that on that sense of the aesthetics and the Andy Warhol cans. Have you ever seen the movie Exit Through the Gift Shop? No. Okay, well, everyone should check that out. It's about Banksy, uh, and no one knows if it's a spoof or not, um, but um, this guy who's kind of the hero villain of the of the movie ends up, yeah, making, like, you know, the street art stuff that's, like, super gaudy and awesome, but, you know, very, very, you know, he hires a lot of props people from the film industry to make super cool stuff. Um, but anyway, people should watch that movie, too. Uh, but there's another idea of, you know, how to make uh, these things look fun and, like, pop cans or whatever you want. Um, let's unleash a little creativity yeah. here. If anyone in the nuclear industry is listening and has a spine to actually, um, sorry. Okay. Um, what <laughs> else can we do with the waste? We're going to get into DGRs. So let's leave that for the end. Um, and like, I, okay. you know, I'm going to say Sheila Whitlock, I love you. And, you know, I think it's, um, yeah, I mean, this is a complex issue. We're going to be sensitive to it. I know people are fighting really hard in their communities, uh, over the DGR issue, and to have pro-nuclear people kind of questioning it uh, probably feels like a huge backstab. So we're going to like handle that sensitively. But I do think, um, you know, Decouple is all about having a broad um, discourse on this. So beyond DGR, um, in your you know, communications masterclass experience, what do you think about recycling the waste, breeders, and shooting the waste into the sun? That's no, a joke. Let's just talk about the recycling and breeding. But I mean, <laughs> isn't the shooting into the sun thing so illustrative of like how insane the discourse is about waste? I'm going to shoot the like the, the world's heaviest, uh, you know, element, you know, anyway. No emissions. Yeah, uh, no, we, we lose all the emissions right, benefits right. of nuclear by like Elon Musk, you know, shooting Falcon rockets of waste into uh, <laughs> anyway. OK, so recycling, breeding, is that is that like a part of your comms? Do you, do you use that? Um, is it useful? I talk about it um, when I talk about nuclear waste being an asset and not a liability. Just pointing out that over 90 percent of what's left is still usable fuel. So in a future where we have breeder reactors or if we so choose, like France, like Japan, we can recycle the waste. Um, now I think it's worth pointing out that we just don't do it right now, mostly because it's not economical, um, and it's fine how it is, but we can decide that if policymakers get together and decide that's a priority, like has been done elsewhere, we can choose to do that. Um, and in fact, like, you know, I think both of us are not skeptical, but reasonably, um, like, I guess maybe skeptical about claims from advanced reactors and how quickly they're going to come online. There's no, there's no economic imperative right now. Like uranium right. is so dirt cheap. And like for this substance that like it is finite, um, it, you know, it's more abundant than gold for sure. But we don't, as Mark was saying, we don't, you know, turn gold into, you know, um, fission products and, and actinides. Um, but right. like, I'd like to make a comparison of like, I don't know what the spot price price of uranium is per pound, but like you ever go to the bulk store and, um, my, my famous scam at the bulk store was buying pine nuts and labeling them as pinto beans. Um, cause pinto <laughs> beans are really cheap and they look alike and cashiers don't really know the difference. Anyway. Um, I hope that's a, a crime for which there's, what do you call it? Like, a All right. Um, we're canceling a grace Chris. period. <laughs> everyone cancel chris cancel decouple <laughs> okay so like navy beans per pound are probably like way cheaper than uh or more expensive i can't remember okay then like uranium per pound so basically like that's my skepticism is like the only urgency or perceived urgency for you know these waste uh, reactors and trust me i think it's really cool as a science project there should be like an eater uh with like they have for fusion for you know molten salts for fast reactors everything else I don't know how you get an economical reactor with having to like pyro process, um, spent, you know, spent fuel. It's kind of hard, you know, hot cells to handle this stuff. Like let's give it a few hundred years when it's totally cooled off. 
I don't know. That's that's where I'm coming from on this. Like that, and again, it's this response to the anti nukes. Well, if we can show we have the solution to the waste, they'll shut up and and give us huge social license and get on Team Nuclear. My my opinion yeah. is they're just going to die off. Um, <laughs> like they're all getting really gray, um, gray haired. Um, but anyway. Yeah, I mean, my like, I guess this sort of gives the game away. But my preferred solution is to just keep on doing what we're doing. And so, and yeah, so I think it's helpful to point out that this is possible, but I certainly don't advocate for it. Like, and that's why we should be doing this. Just saying that, yeah, the, I think it gives people some sort of, like, it breaks what we think about or it, like breaks that notion in their brain that this is waste forever. It's useless. It's so dangerous. It's like, this can be future fuel if we choose for it to be, but it's also fine now. So it's more of a comms than I think this is the path forward, at least in the near future. Yeah, and I mean, shout outs to Replanet. They've done a great uh, campaign in, in, well, not just in Europe now, because they're taking over, man. They're worldwide, Australia, um, et cetera. But, uh, you know, they've had a great campaign about, you know, I'm not sure if it's like don't waste the waste, but like there's there's all this energy in it. We could power Europe for X long um, just using the waste. Um, so I think that rebrand is is key and we're talking about a comms masterclass. So I want to give some shout outs where shout outs are due. I think like a big issue is uh, the kind of over like the industry responds by, OK, we're going to over engineer everything. This is an engineering problem, not a comms problem. And that's, you know, I think one of my big objections to DGR is is like, why does nuclear waste have this like special like why are we playing into these special making it a specially dangerous waste that needs I mean, okay, just to give you some numbers, because I, I did this, you know, physician perspective on nuclear waste. I went and talked in, you know, the most likely host community of uh, the Canadian Deep Geologic Repository. Again, even though I have some misgivings, I was like, I'm going to go, you know, help my brothers and sisters out there. And I think it was a really good talk. But before I did that, I needed to get really prepped and know my facts. And we always talk about like dose rate when we're talking about radiation. You mentioned the Bacurel's issue, et cetera, making some comparisons. So the worst case scenario at the planned Canadian DGR with all the engineering and barriers they're talking about, because we have some of the best rock in the world, where it takes, you know, three to three million, 30 million years for water to infiltrate a meter through the rock. Anyway, the worst case scenario, not just uh, that, um, you know, the casks fail and there's a little defect in the weld and water slowly infiltrates in, you know, dissolves the zirconium um, cladding and the fuel dissolves the ceramic, which really doesn't happen in an anoxic environment. And then the water slowly trickles out through the tiny well defect. They're like, no, no, there's not even a cask. Um, there's this huge geologic fault they didn't um, recognize. There's a few other sort of, you know, they're, they're sort of disadvantaging themselves. The, the, the maximally exposed theoretical person like lives in the most quote unquote contaminated spot, gets all their water from a well there, raises their, you know, meat and grains and everything on that piece of land um, you get the picture 80 nano sieverts per year is the worst case scenario totally unrealistic scenario but worst case scenario so to put that in perspective that is one one thousandth of the dose that you get if you have um a ionization smoke detector in your house the most common form of smoke detectors right like this is this is bonkers this is bonkers 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 and it's like and we're we want to get it even better than that and it's like and and they'll go and do these talks in communities and they'll have a whole thing on here's our copper specialist and here's how amazing our copper layer is and you know here's pieces of copper you know that are, you know from underground that are still intact despite being it, it, it's it's great science but it's like you are scaring the bejesus out of people you guys notice i'm using non-swear words here bejesus out of people um with this like obsessive over engineering and, and, you know, this project's going to cost $26 billion. I'm like, how many kids could you, like, you can make university free for, I don't know how long with $26 billion. Um, it's like, it's a misallocation of precious societal resources. And so it's like, so if you want to bury it, like, could you just do it basically in the dry casks and like a big hole that you drill? Like, what would be that? Like, what I want to know is what's the worst case scenario maximum dose rate you get? Um, when does it happen? Because again, that 80 nanosieverts per year, it happens in a million years, by the way. I mean, I don't know, you're you're like, I think more on the optimist and the doomer pessimist side, but a million years, humanity, we'll see. Um, anyway, I'm I'm preaching here. Um, sorry yeah. about that. But like, no. you know, that's where I'm coming from. No, I, I think you're exactly right. And so, you know, I talk about in my original waste thread, this really ticked off 
people in the industry when I said, we've spent $15 billion on Yucca Mountain for zero deaths prevented, zero cancers prevented, zero additional safety benefit. I mean, talk about wasting societal resources. And so I think if we are going to change the way we store our waste, there needs to be some added benefit. Now, I could believe that having dry casks, replacing them every 100 years, having them stored at each individual site where they all need their own monitoring staff, own security staff, is probably not the most efficient way. So I'm all for a different solution that has some sort of benefit and likely because of how safe waste is, how little environmental risk it poses, it's going to come down to economics. So if you tell me if we centralize the waste, we will be able to have one security staff, one monitoring staff, transportation costs will be small compared to what we save, eliminating waste across the sites, like across having, you know, 70 plus sites of waste, then I'm open to it. But then my next question is instantly going to become, so why does that have to be underground? Why can't that be above ground? And Or high, uh, or high store, right? Like super shallowly bur- buried, but like fully accessible and retrievable. Right. I just think burying it, talking about getting it far away from the biosphere or as far away from humans reaffirms the idea that this waste is uniquely dangerous, which just isn't true, like is scientifically not factual. Yeah. Um, So I like from a communication standpoint, I don't think it's good. I, you know, this is going to sound maybe I shouldn't even say it. Well, it's fine. Say it. It might. I'm trying not to. I really don't mean this as like a way to troll. I just, I do believe there are some spiritual needs that humans have. And part of that is why I love the idea of painting the casks, like making it feel good, bringing the public in, like making something beautiful out of waste. And so maybe you just believe in Canada that we could make this into like a beautiful underground temple to show just our prowess and might and how wealthy we are as a nation, and that meets some spiritual need. But I don't think that's actually what's going on there. I think that does more public harm by reaffirming the danger of waste and does good by alleviating fears of it. But again, if there, if you, if you know, the waste management company, I know that's wrong, of Canada comes to me and just says, actually, we ran the numbers and this is cheaper to consolidate. And the facility underground means that we don't have to meet certain regulations that would be above ground and blah, blah, blah. Um, And it's cheaper Then I am totally for it, actually. And I will fight the kind of uphill gradient on comms because I think it makes nuclear cheaper. Um, But there's, I just think it comes from this obsession of like, Nuclear is unique and has to be walk away safe. It has to be safe for 40,000 years, but we don't treat anything else in society like that. We don't have walk away oil refineries. We don't have walk away cities because we plan for society to continue. And I think that's healthy. Like you said, I'm an optimist. I think humans are really good at making dangerous things safe. I think we should plan for society to continue on and continue prospering. And so I'm right. comfortable with continuous management. And, and it's not, it's not dangerous for that long. Right. Like, right. And, you know, I think I had a little, um, quibble with Nick Turan or, you know, claiming that, you know, the waste basically returns, returns to the level of radioactivity of the ore, you know, from which, and that's kind of like, you can imagine a beautiful story of that. Like, you know, this is a circular thing. We mined it from the ground. We return it to the ground. It returns to the same level of radioactivity. That, that's true in terms of the fission products, which is really what we care about. It's not true. There's a few extra transuranics, which are very long lived. Uh, but again, you got to crush them up and do lines of them, snorting them, um, ingest them, or they need to travel. They have to, okay, they have to get dissolved by this water that makes its way through rock at the pace of three to 30 million um, uh, years per meter. You know, get through the bentonite clay, which is also just absolutely incredible barrier. Get through the casks, get through the copper, the steel, get through the cladding, as I said, dissolve the ceramic, get all the way back out, go out through the rocks. And then, oh, this is the other factor they didn't they 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 put against themselves in terms of these maximum doses. 
Uh, there's something called sorption, which is radionuclides in solution moving through rock. Most of them avidly bind to the rock, and so it's almost like a filter of it getting out. The one isotope that they say is the biggest worry is an isotope of iodine, I think it's 129 or 126. Half-life, 16 million years. Jerry Thomas is big on this. Uh, Geraldine Thomas, the, the who runs the Chernobyl Tissue Bank, you know, the world, one of the basically the world expert on on the thyroid cancer implications of Chernobyl. She's like the reason that you know it's only kids, and that's not a great story, but people, kids with rapidly dividing thyroid cells. The reason that those folks had an elevated rate is because of you know it's the biological half life plus the physical half life. So iodine one three one physical half life of eight days and a um, biological half-life in the body of 80 days, that means basically all the energy in that pretty damn energetic um, isotope, radionuclide, is deposited in the thyroid. Didn't cause cancer in adults. But, you know, and so they're, they're obsessing over this, this other isotope of iodine with a half-life of 16 million years because it's one that doesn't sorp into the rock as it would make its way out, you know, over the course of like, you know, I don't know, three to 30 million years per meter and we've got to get through the Coburg formation you know into the other strata and the Coburg formation is like 100 200 meters thick like it's just it's bonkers it's bonkers right and I'm officially inviting myself back on to decouple in the near future to talk about this because it's a whole separate can of worms but Recently, I've been doing a deep dive on Hanford because so many of the comments um, from the New York Times and even in response to my initial waste thread were like, what about Hanford? You didn't even talk about Hanford. And my impulse is, well, is, you know, most nuclear advocates are just to say, well, that has nothing to do with commercial nuclear energy. That's weapons production. But I finally was like, no, I actually wonder because my, because the, you know, what the public believes about nuclear waste is so different from reality. Could that be true of the most nuclear, the most toxic nuclear waste dump in the world? And what you just find is even like they chose the Hanford site because they were like, well, we're going to be spilling all this liquid waste. So we might as well have an arid sort of desert-like strong rock where it's not going to immediately leach into the groundwater. But they're releasing iodine-131 into the air. They are like leaking waste intentionally and then unintentionally underground. And this has been really studied and it's sort of like, anyways, I don't want to exaggerate, but they're they found zero evidence that even during the years of largest releases of iodine, no excess thyroid cancer, no excess thyroid abnormalities of any kind, no human health impacts based on the doses we're seeing. Most of the site falls within the levels that the EPA sets for post-remediation. So like is already well within conservative levels. It's just we eat, and that's worst case scenario. And so you think about what actually happened there. They spent like five billion dollars in twenty twenty three dollars on this crash weapons program. They turned on the B reactor twenty two months, less than two years after the experiment under Stagfield that proved that a chain reaction was even possible. That is insane. And the stakes were so high, right? Like, we needed to get a bomb before Nazi Germany did during the deadliest, largest war in the world. Meanwhile, we have spent to date something like $13 billion, and now annual spending is above $2 billion on Hanford cleanup, which is saving zero lives. Like, it right now... The, the report on the environmental impacts is that even direct releases did not affect aquatic biota. And in fact, it's a nature reserve because of the lack of human interference. And so the authors of this study say, you know, it might be that it's actually worse, remediation is worse because of what potentially will happen afterwards, because humans will either move in or it'll become a different industrial site. Anyways, I just find it helpful to say, what is the actual worst case scenario? Like Chernobyl yep. with safety, like Hanford with waste. And just put it into context to show it's really not apocalyptic. People like to put the apocalypse onto nuclear because of 
this like transference of fear from nuclear weapons. But when we actually look at the issues, it's just so much less risky than we actually think it is. Yeah. No, and I, th- I think that's like a you know big objection with the Fukushima stuff is okay, sure it didn't kill anyone from radiation, uh, but they're banking like a hundred billion dollars on cleanup, and it's like to get to like millisievert levels, uh, you know, back to kind of normal levels of background radiation. Meanwhile, you know, let's evacuate Denver, Colorado, because you're around ten millisieverts per year, and like almost the entire prefecture is like I don't know five anyway below ten. It's it's completely insane. Um, but you know, that's where you're scraping up all the topsoil off of like these super fertile rice fields, uh, putting it in big plastic bags. That's the, like, just, I don't know, Robert Bryce, we had an episode about his visit to Fukushima and just the number of tanks of tritiated water sitting on site. Like that's what scares the shit out of people and makes them go, yeah, I don't know about this. Um, and that is on the industry. I guess it's on the regulators as well. Um, and that's on Gregory Jackso, who scared the crap out of the Japanese population with, you know, false ideas around uh, spent fuel. Um, back to waste, <laughs> spent fuel pool fire. Um, and that, I don't know if you know anything about that stuff, but I think that that is kind of interesting. Maybe we were over an hour, so we'll, we'll get to that in another episode, perhaps. You know, the, the thing that is strikes me as, as absolutely bonkers is that nuclear is still economic. It's the second cheapest source of electricity in Ontario here, for instance. It was the cheapest source of electricity in Germany. Um, you know, except for really wacky deregulated markets where wind and solar can come in with zero marginal costs and outprice on the five minute spot market. Nukes are doing pretty great economically, uh, particularly ones that have been around for a while. But anyway, um, that proviso out of the way. Um, still economic, despite putting aside twenty six billion dollars for a DGR, um, you know, still economic, despite, you know, the enormous budget of well, I, I won't talk any slack, but, you know, um, it's, it's pretty incredible, um, and I think a testament to how economic and how much more economic nuclear could be. Um, and then one other reflection, um, you know, at the DGR, like the level of planning. And again, like you go and visit with organizations like the NWMO. You walk in, you spend the first half hour going like, this is insane. These people are crazy. And then you go like, wow, this is so cool. You know, this like you know, this, this degree again of making dangerous things safe to this level, like it's, it's ingenious, like, and the level of expertise of the scientists involved, incredible. Um, but you know, just to give you a sense of like their worst case scenario planning, they were modeling, like, what if a meteor hits the deep geologic repository and essentially like the, the, the power of the meteor strike would essentially like wipe out the dinosaurs. Like it would wipe out life on earth, uh, in terms of actually causing, you know, I'm not even sure if it's a significant radiation release. It might just be any radiation release. Um, anyway, you get the sense. Um, and I think, I think with, you know, I don't want to end on my diatribe. So why don't you have one last diatribe, Maddie, and then we'll we'll wrap her up in a bow. Well, yeah, I mean, when it, when I talk about like people like to think about the apocalypse with the waste. And so, yeah, what if a meteor hit? What if like something for a cask, People ask what happens if a cask breaks open. And like, I do try to be as like literally, you know, take them at their word, like, okay, here's what would literally happen. But just explain if a cask cracks open and some of that inert gas gets out, most of the stuff would be contained, but you probably would not give a crap about it because whatever happened, like you would have way bigger problems from whatever caused that cask to get cracked open. And it's that same meteor example. But I want to just reiterate like what you're saying with the DGR. I think it is an incredible, like humans are just incredible. And the the level of expertise and how we can make things safe. This isn't like my critiques of DGR have nothing to do with the people that I think are earnestly working hard to make what they think is make the public feel safe and secured from this waste. I just argue that, you know, I've all I've had a really high success rate of just being honest with people, talking to them, showing them pictures, and that there's this alternative world where we don't have to engineer a solution to nuclear waste, where this is a, a public engagement problem and we can just engage honestly and openly with the public. So people like to ask, well, then what do you suggest? If not DGR, if not recycling, And I just think continue to assure day-to-day safety with casks, with monitoring exactly what we're doing. I do think there is a legitimate criticism, which is that 
the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, at least in for the U.S., you know, says we will have some sort of repository. And so we just abandoned that. And right now our plan is just, okay, well, like the utilities just have to deal with it and we're being very unintentional. I think it's important to be intentional with your waste plan. So we talked about the Netherlands before. What they do is basically convene every 20 years, reevaluate, look at the advances in technology, look at the advances in science, look at how their waste has fared thus far, and say, okay, well, should we change anything? Nope, we're all good. See you again in 20 years. I actually really like that. Nuclear waste storage, I believe, becomes cheaper with time because we can see what we at, like what is realistically needed with it. Um, and then the most important thing that we've already talked about is just let the public see it. And I would think even better, let the, it be an actual public asset. I mean, I'm sure the NRC will have a lot to say if they ever listen to this and hear me talk about making it a park. But like, can't we commission local artists in Zion to paint, to have like an art contest where each one is assigned a different, you know, we have it be a gallery of waste. That might, um, Maddie, that might, that might cost, know. that might cost too much. And like, here's an example of, uh, here's an example <laughs> right. of the economics here. So, you know, there's two potential sites in Ontario. Um, one's in like the most perfect rock in the world um, down, like very close to all the nuclear plants. One is like pretty far up north. Um, you know, it's still, the rock is still absolutely fine. It's a little more contentious because it's, uh, you know, there's, um, you know, more indigenous folks nearby, et cetera. Um, but you know what I was told is like, and I was like, so why would you pick that site way the way up north when the power plants are all in the south? And they go, well, listen, I mean, it's all about like us getting the community consent. So if, if you know community consent is better up there and we choose that site, it's only an extra seven hundred and sixty million dollars to transport the waste up there. Seven hundred and sixty million dollars. Let's let's pay some artists, um, you know, more than their starving artist wages, and make this stuff beautiful and. And, uh, you know, just help people change, change their understanding. Cause I think, you know, the work that you're doing on that front, um, I think is again, where, whereas like the over-engineering of waste solutions just furthers the fear mongering. Um, it's like, it's, it's as effective as the anti-nuclear movement in creating fear, terror, et cetera, about the waste. And like, even getting back to like, so what if a dry cask cracks in half? I mean, let's let's actually walk that through. And I think that's a useful thing to walk through with people. It's like green ooze doesn't leak out of there. You know, volatile gases, I don't even think leak out of there. You have, you know, this inverse square law. Like if you're again, we went through those stats. If it's been 100 years, 200 years and you're you're standing um, 30 centimeters away for an hour, you'll get four CT scans worth of dose. Who's going to go and like, I mean, I'm sure curious onlookers might come and check it out for a little bit, but like they're not going to stand 30 centimeters away for, for an hour, right? Like, right. And like, at least here, the NRC has studied this issue. Like we live in a scary world. So people reasonably ask like, what if nuclear waste was targeted by a terrorist? And it is like, I really don't want to mock people's very real fears, but it almost sounds like you're mocking them when you walk them through. Okay. Realistically. So these things weigh like a hundred, you know, or like they just are massive. You, you could not carry them with a truck. You couldn't just like pull up your pickup, but somehow you manage to like break through the security of a nuclear power plant, which in the U S is heavily, heavily armed. You manage to steal a vehicle from somewhere, either on site, but mo- probably from somewhere else to get this cask. You manage to yeah, somehow those, those things, drive those, it the, slowly yeah. down the highway without <laughs> like invading, like invading SWAT helicopter to your like Batman style underground cave. And you have to like the NRC looked and they're like, you would have to like strategically know you would have to know the inside and out of this cast to be able to detonate it. Like they they just, just they said there's no credible terrorism threat. And in a worst case scenario, if somehow, like say, ignore all of that and just say they managed to like blow up a spent fuel assembly in a high populated area 
I think they predicted like one premature death and 270 premature cancers or cancers that may not have de- like it's just and so they they wrote there is no credible scenario so we just can't even regulate around this i mean it's we've really done a great job of making it safe but yeah like trying to get every you know every extra nano sievert or protect against yeah dinosaur level meteor is just feels crazy like we're operating in in a reality that is not well, our and, own. and like how far do you take it because it's like okay meteors may be a threat so we're gonna need to have um you know some nuclear missile silos as part of our air defense system so that when the meteor comes we can you know use our icbms to blow up the meteor before it hits the dgr like you can you can start like logically moving to that degree of ridiculousness when you don't just say, okay, we stop here because this is just so not credible. And I mean, <clears throat> I guess there's been that error in terms of nuclear hubris, like in the early days of nuclear power, Jack Devaney, I think does a great job of this, where it's like, they are saying, well, essentially a nuclear power plant having a meltdown is impossible. Um, and you know, that was hubristic and it's, it's frankly bullshit. We've had meltdowns, but what were the consequences of the meltdown? So we need to like actually talk realistically and mechanistically about those consequences um, and acknowledge, hey, like theoretically something could happen, you know? It's, yeah. It, it, it's, it's not really credible to even imagine that it could, but let's let's you know, like say that there are black swan events. What are the consequences? The cask breaks open and the, like, the fuel clad uranium pellets don't go anywhere. <laughs> like, just, right. You know, <clears throat> anyway, I think we've gone on long enough. Um, now we're heading into just uh, whatever banter. Maddie, it's it's been great. This has been fun. I think we've probably offended way too many people. Um, to those people, I say, you know, hats off to you. My respect again for, you know, the the scientific expertise, the engineer, engineering expertise for working within what are perceived to be the constraints of public perceptions. Um, but I think <clears throat> really important in a world of nuclear communications, particularly industry communications, where it's like. This is the party line, and it must be towed all the way down through the entire hierarchy. Um, it's 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 North Korea esque. It's like commissar esque. Uh, and again, that's probably going to offend people, but I, I'm serious. Like, take a look in the mirror uh, in terms of the comms culture, because uh, I don't think it's winning. And you know, for the best ideas to surface. I mean, <laughs> getting back to kind of I think Jesse's and and Emmett's conversation or some other conversations have had like. In a free, pluralistic society, like one of the reasons the U.S. Um, could outcompete the Soviet Union, many reasons, but one is like a free, democratic, pluralistic society with freedom of speech and ideas is just such a benefit to actually selecting what are the best ideas. So at the very least, accept this humble shot in the darkness of some heterodoxy and let's let's have better conversations. And we could be wrong. That's fine. Yeah, prove. I want the evidence. I w- if someone has it, prove me wrong. I really am serious about if someone has an economic analysis showing that these repositories are cheaper, I would love to see it. I mean, I'm always looking for ways to make nuclear more affordable. So I would lo- love, love, love to see that in all, you know, being very genuine. Okay, cool. We'll leave it there. Um, Maddie, pleasure. We'll have you back. Um, I think you, you gave us the long and skinny on Hanford, but uh, you know that's a fascinating example. That's and gonna we'll find piss some many, people off. So <laughs> we're the we're the bad boys of and and bad nuke bros, nuke nuke gals of of nuclear advocacy. So thick skins, many arrows in them. Um, it's all good. Um, I'm sure we'll find many more excuses to have you back over the many more years of decouple. And holy crap, we are coming up on the third anniversary of Decouple. That will be May 26th when the magic wow. started. You know, shortly after lockdown here in Canada, and this was the coping mechanism, started very humbly. We had 40 downloads in the first two weeks, <clears throat> you know, in terms of my stats. And now we're into the, you know, 10,000 range. Um, so to the audience, thank you for sticking around, being loyal. Um, please do support us on Patreon. Um, and uh, yeah, subscribe. And after that, farewell. Um, stay classy, stay radiant, as Emmett would say. And uh, it's been been a slice um, and many more years of, of decoupling to come. So um, it's a community. Let's all let's all uh, 
enjoy it. Okay, enough. Bye. Talk to you soon, Maddie. <laughs> Bye, Chris.